morning are from Galatians and also from John. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. And from John, Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hot dogs, hamburgers, community celebrations, parades, fireworks. That's what we think of when we think about the 4th of July, Independence Day. When I was uh, director at Aldersgate a lot of years ago, every summer we usually had two or three staff from other countries from around the world. We always appreciated the years when we had uh, any uh, staff from Great Britain, because then we can talk about how we won our independence over the tyranny of, uh, of the uh, British. And it was not well received, but you know, hey, that doesn't matter to me. If I can dig, put a little dig in there, I always thought was good. But you know, we celebrate this and we talk about the freedom that we gained. And we have been. We are blessed. Sometimes I get a little frustrated when I hear people praying and asking, oh, I wish God would bless our country. God is blessing our country. We are so blessed. And we only have to travel to other parts of the world to realize how blessed we are. Now, I've had limited travel experiences, but I've had some that really helped me to appreciate what we have here. Just a year and a half ago, I went to a trip, on a trip to Cuba. And where we visited with Christians in a number of different communities. Christians who were not able to go and evangelize to make new disciples for Jesus Christ because the government wasn't going to allow it. Christians who were not allowed to be in mission to their neighbors because the government said, we will provide everything that is needed even when it wasn't. And so we met Christians who, at least according to what uh, liberties they were given by their government, were extremely limited. I've been to Honduras, and where we did mission, and we were stopped along the roadway by somebody in uniform. I don't know if it was a policeman or not. But they're trying to shake us down for money so that we could uh, travel through. I was so grateful to have a uh, volunteer and mission, uh, missionary there with us because he knew how to talk his way through this. If it had just been uh, a handful of us from New Jersey, we would have been in trouble. But this is a regular occurrence where people can't even travel within the capital city of Tegucigalpa without having to wonder whether they're going to be uh, stopped and confronted. I've been to Mexico City where we were warned not to park our 
van outside <coughs> very long without checking on it. And we were in a very rough section of the city because the van would be stripped. And what we were told was that, well, you could go to the police, but the police are being paid off by the people who are stripping the vehicles. So it will do no good. And we saw thousands of homes made with cardboard and corrugated tin that were built on top of the city dump because the people had been displaced so that Walmart and other retailers could build in the city. And the people who had never been able to afford to even shop in those stores were just told, find some other place. I've traveled to the Holy Land. I've traveled through a wall that has been, has been built between Israel and the West Bank. And as a U.S. citizen, we're on a bus, we basically just kind of zip right through. But then I meet people who have had their land divided by this wall, and it may take them up to two hours just to go through security so they can go and visit their family on the other side. We are so blessed in this nation to be able to just travel wherever we'd like, for instance, without worrying about being stopped or stopping, except for traffic. <laughs> but that's our choice. That is not uh, a given. It's not even something somebody does to us. We, it's because we all of us want to go and do this. We have so many freedoms to be able to speak and to say what we would like. When we look around the world and we see others. At the same time, as I have been in these other places, I have seen a freedom that people experience and we sometimes forget. And that is a freedom that comes from faith. And so, while in Cuba, and hearing how the government was not going to allow them to grow the church, and that as you walk down the street, if you were carrying a Bible, you better have your hand over where it said Bible, because you could be stopped. They didn't let that stop them. And they started a house church movement, where today there are over 10,000 house churches in an island of 11 million people. One of my colleagues on the cabinet is from Cuba, and he said, oh, why do you do it? You know, we would get together, we we have a meal together, we sing, we pray, somebody would deliver some kind of a word, and if the police came, which they did, you just said, oh, we're just a group of friends having dinner together. But they have grown the church there. And the people have found ways to learn how to be in mission. And sometimes it's a challenge. We went to one village where there was a church that was trying to drill a well so that the town could have clean drinking water. And at that point, people were spending 40% of their income, which averaged $12 a week, on water. And the government was saying, well, we don't know if we really need a well. But they're saying, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going because they're called by Christ and they feel the freedom Christ gives them to work for what needs to happen. In Honduras, we worked at a church, Fuerzas Unidas, which is in one of the roughest sections of the city, Tegucigalpa. It's where people who have been displaced end up. The church itself has been built by the United Methodists and it's built inside a compound we raise our wire around the top because it's not safe. But they're offering child care. They're offering food. They are offering worship and Bible study. They are, they are offering health, medical, and dental care to a community of people who need the love of Jesus. Even though the community is so rough and violent, they don't let that stand in the way. 
in Mexico City. We worked in this little church. And they were in a very rough section of the city. And it's offering hope and doing whatever they can. And the reason they couldn't do more for themselves is every dollar that came in, or Facebook that came in, went out to help people in need. And so their, quote, ministry center was created on, a, on the ground, dirt covered by a carpet, and tarps overhead. And we were there to help them have a more permanent ministry center so they could continue to reach out in love to their neighbors. We, I visited the Bethlehem Bible College in Bethlehem, you know, the place where Jesus was born. You might remember that. I know it's not Christmas, but it's around that. Where we talked to missionaries, one of them being a, one of our own General Board of Global Ministries missionaries, who are training pastors and church leaders to bring hope to the Arab world and to Arab Christians because there is no place for them to learn and to grow. And they're not letting a wall stand in the way. Do they like these? No. What do you like? How's that? Do they like this, these conditions? No, but are they willing to work with them and do what they need to do? Yes, because they feel the freedom that Christ gives them to do what God calls us to do in our baptism. We are blessed in this country, and yet we still have limitations. And we still have people who are like, well, you know, we're not supposed to do this, so I guess we won't. But God gives us freedom that no government and grant that no power or principality of this world can offer to us because it comes be through our faith in Jesus Christ who frees us to love one another as sisters and brothers no matter what our culture or society says. What's sometimes difficult to comprehend, though, as we heard in the portion of Paul's letter to the Galatians, is that in order to really be free, we have to do something. Now, I will admit, I, I'm not crazy about the words. I wish they used different language in here. If only Paul or God had consulted me ahead of time, <laughs> we would have gotten it right. Okay, but we have to, but these are the words we're given. That we actually have to become slaves to Christ and to one another in love. Now, that slave word bothers me. But I understand what Paul is saying as I think about the context in which he is writing. You know, in Paul's day and age, in that culture, there were so many divisions between the rich and the poor, the citizen and the non-citizen, men, women, all those divisions. Guess what? They're the same isms that we struggle with today. We have a lot of our isms today with racism and sexism and classism that divide us. And Paul is writing to the church and saying, you have to stop being a slave to that and rather be a slave to Christ. Fully committed. The difference is that when we are enslaved to Christ, we voluntarily put ourselves there. No one else is making us do that. And when we do that, we are then free to be the people that God calls us to be. Not as somebody else defines for us, but as we are able to define for ourselves. We are able to be that person that God has made us to be and not who somebody else tells us. Now we all work in systems. 
We all live in systems. And yeah, you know, in the church, we have systems. There are things that we do sometimes just to keep the system happy. All right? Our conference reports. <laughs> um, we do certain things just to keep things going. But where's our real commitment? Where is it that we are really living out our faith? Where we see that we are, we are free to do that. Now, it doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be, uh, it's going to be challenging. It's challenging for, for a variety of reasons. One is that we live in a world where we sometimes confuse freedom and license. Well, I promised I was going to get too political today, but I'm going to get a little bit. This isn't about any one party or any one person. But sometimes I think we've confused the idea that just because we're free to say something, like we have the freedom of speech, is it always helpful? We think we have this license to say just about anything. But is it helpful? As Christians, you know, you could be sitting here and say, you know, I hate that tie you're wearing. I guess you could tell me that won't hurt my feelings too bad. I think I'm the only one in the room wearing a tie. Okay? <laughs> My mom kind of raised me to wear a tie to church. I'm not sure why. But is it helpful? Does it help to build one another up in love as Christ calls us to do? Think about what our political structures would look like if we just got a little bit that way right now. Just moved a little in that direction. Just because I can say it doesn't mean I have to. And is what I'm saying being helpful to move us to a better place? And so, just because we have a freedom, we have to ask what we do with that. We also have a way to use our freedoms, particularly the freedom Christ gives us to be Christians in the world, to move to a better place. And this is not always well accepted. Before I went on the district, I served in Butler Church. And after I was there a couple years, we started a ministry to the Latino community in town that on paper was approximately 10% of the population, but in reality it was probably closer to 18 to 20% of the population there. What did we do? Well, we offered English as second language classes for those who wanted to learn how to speak English. We made sure we opened our food pantry in the evening because most of these folks were day workers and they couldn't, if they took off time to come to our food pantry in the morning, they would lose a day's wage. So we opened up in the evening. We actually changed some of the foods we had in the food pantry. Guess what? Not everybody in the world likes beefaroni. <laughs> <laughs> you know, canned ravioli. They actually like things that are less expensive, like rice and beans. <laughs> we opened a thrift shop in the evenings so that people who couldn't get there during the day because they were working. And then we did some very radical things. At the request of the community, we started the Bible study and then eventually started worship. Of all things, we were going to praise Jesus Christ in two languages. And we had opposition to every single step along the way. We actually had some of our elected officials say to us, if you would just stop caring about these people, they would move out of town. <laughs> and our response was, these people are our sisters and brothers. We did nothing to cross any legal boundary, but we certainly weren't going to let some of the attitudes and things that we had experienced in the community as Christians get in our way of doing what Christ called us to do, which was to love our neighbor. It's not always a popular thing, but by our baptism, we are called to be reaching out in the name of Jesus, even when others are not always crazy about it. We are free to do that. We have communities in this state where 
neighborhoods are rising up and they don't want food pantries being run through the church because we don't want those kind of people coming into our neighborhood. That has actually happened right within our own communities. We have churches that have actually gone to court, United Methodist churches across our denomination, because they were trying to open up feeding programs for people during the day, and the communities were stopping them saying, we don't want to have outsiders who are hungry coming and eating at our church in our neighborhood. But the church wasn't going to be quiet. They had a higher freedom they were called to. We are free to love. And that was the first and foremost. You know, we are freed by Christ to do amazing things. And that also can become personally transforming. This isn't just about what we do as a community or outreach ministries. I had a friend a number of years ago, great guy. I didn't know him until he was uh, retired. But he had been an advertising executive, worked in Manhattan. It was a high profile, a high paying job. Did very well at that. But it also was high stress, high stress. And, his, and the stress was such that it made him an angry person. Now, when I met him, I'm like, no, it just didn't. But this was his, this was his story as he shared with me. He was angry. He was angry at life. He was angry at everything. He would go home and he was angry at his family. He didn't want to hang around people. He said his favorite thing to do was to go down to the basement and to nail and, and to hammer nails into wood just for the purpose of smashing something. Now, I've had those days myself, but <laughs> they're moments by moment. You know, moment by moment. But he, he just found himself always angry, always tense, always upset, until his wife cajoled him, cajoled him into going on a church retreat. I'm sure if all the things he was saying, he was kind of like, well, I'll go, I won't like it, but it's easier than arguing. At least that's how it started. And he started to feel his life being transformed because on that experience, he heard the voice of Jesus Christ. God's spirit started to work within him to realize that he was not the executive. He was not the person who was paid much. He was somebody different. And that God had created him. And he started to find a peace within, within himself. And that freed him up to be a different person. And so he became somebody who was a great mentor to others. He became a leader in the church. He used his, all of the skills that he had in new ways. It wasn't like he just abandoned his whole, his whole life. It just transformed it. Because he felt the freedom to not be defined by what he did, but by who God created him to be. I have another friend who used to remind us all the time that we are not human doings. We are human beings. And we are loved because we are created by God, and all of us are. All across the globe, we are all loved by God. We are all part of the same human family. And we are here to support and care for each other as we are, not as somebody else defines us. It's kind of sad when I look around and I see how much division that we have in the world, even sometimes in the name of Christ. But when we can hear that call of God in our lives, that we are free, we are free to be who we are, which means we are going to have different opinions. We are going to look at things differently. But think about what our world would be like if we could just say, this is the truth as I experience. This is the truth that I know. And I can live with the fact that you experience life differently and your truth may be a little bit different. Think how freeing that is. And I've seen this in my own family recently with a Facebook feud. 
between a couple of members of the family. One who is very, very good at pointing out, you know, well, you, if you just follow Jesus, everything will be fine if you do it my way. And I'm thinking how sad it is that people just can't say, why don't you look at it your way? And I understand that. That that's where your perspective is. But I look at it a little bit differently, and that's where my perspective is. There is no need to tear another down in order to build ourselves up. If only we could remember that. That we are free to each think and believe as we have experienced Christ in our lives. One of the biblical passages that I struggle with uh, because I don't see it being lived down. But it speaks a reality. It comes back, goes back to the book of Genesis and Jacob and Esau, twins. And there was a little bit, no, there was a lot of sibling rivalry between the two of them. And there is a point where Jacob receives the blessing from their father, Isaac. And he is and Esau comes in and finds out that he has been cheated out of his, the blessing. That was his. And he says to his father, is there only one blessing? Christ frees us to say there's more than one blessing. We are all blessed because we are all children of God. Christ frees us to be the child of God we are called to be. And so as we remember freedom, let us remember that our call as Christians is a deeper, more meaningful freedom that surpasses anything that a human authority can give us because it's a gift from God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray.